Welcome to Women Invested, Women on a Mission to Change the World. I'm Carrie Van Winkle. We're here with my co-host, Malaika Mafalala. Uh, both of us are with Natural Investments, and we are very excited today to interview our guest, Susan Baker. She's a vice president or a vice president of shareholder advocacy with Trillium Impact Investments. And we are really excited to talk with her today about Trillium and really also spotlight this whole area of socially responsive investing um, called shareholder advocacy. So welcome, Susan. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Malika. So uh, Susan, uh, like I said, she's the vice, a vice president of shareholder advocacy with Trillium Asset Management. She has over 20 years experience in the investment industry, um, mentored early in her career by Joan Bavaria. Am I saying her name? correctly? Bavaria, like the country. Okay. Um, The founder of, Joan was the founder of Trillium and a pioneer in the field of responsible and sustainable investing. And uh, I've heard some beloved mention of Joan, I think, from other advisors. Um, And uh, Susan has long believed that women's voices and leadership skills are important and beneficial to the investment field. She has held several positions at Trillium and for the past 10 years has been a member of Trillium's shareholder advocacy team, leading direct communication with company leadership on issues including board and workplace diversity, human and labor rights, and environmental health. She earned a BA from Middlebury College and master's in education from Harvard University and currently serves on some pretty amazing boards, including the board of the 30% Coalition, the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, and is currently the board chair of the Pesticide Action Network of North America. Susan lives in Arlington, Massachusetts with her husband, George, and she can be frequently found tending their tomato garden, hiking, and keeping up with the lives of her her two grown children. We are excited to have you. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Susan. Um, So I'll kick off our um, interview questions here by just asking you to give us, um, the listeners, a kind of overview of the the work that Trillium does um, and how it's creating positive change in the world. Sure. So Trillium is a registered investment advisor. We've been around for over three decades, and we're dedicated solely to responsible and sustainable investing. And we do that uh, through our managed investment accounts for individuals as well as endowments, foundations, and other nonprofits. So what is your uh, particular role at Trillium these days? And then along with that, we'd love for you to tell us um, more about shareholder advocacy as a a tool. So um, let me just tell you initially, how we create positive impact in the world at Trillium. And we really do that in four ways. I want to make sure I lay that groundwork first um, because we're unique in that we have not only the integration of environmental, social, and governance factors into our investment decision-making process, but we also have uh, try to maximize our social and environmental impact with the shareholder advocacy component, with uh, community impact investing, and with some public policy we do, we do as well. So there's really a, a layering of added social dividends, if you will, to the initial integration of environmental and social factors. Um, clearly the you know allocation of capital to companies that are improving their ESG uh, performance is going to benefit shareholders we believe in the long run uh, and benefit our economy and society and the planet at large Uh, so my role is in the shareholder shareholder advocacy area And that really means being a responsible owner of a corporation and being an active owner, um, engaging companies to influence and inform them on a wide range of environmental and social issues. 
So I am talking to companies. I am uh, engaging in uh, what shareholders can do, which is file shareholder proposals on areas of interest where we think the board of companies, where the management of companies should take an interest and other shareholders join us in pressing them to either disclose or to improve environmental or social performance on a particular issue. And you had mentioned a number of those at the outset. Um, board diversity is a very important issue that I work on. It affects women um, when we look at gender diversity. Sustainable agriculture is another area where I've been um, actively engaging companies women farmers around the world are um, impacted by corporate practices and chemical footprinting is actually a new issue that i've started to work on um, more and more consumers want to know what they put on their bodies the personal care products they use we've been engaging companies to look at those chemicals of high concern and to seek safer alternatives you actually addressed it pretty nicely, but I wonder if you could uh, give some more specifics about one or two uh, shareholder ad advocacy initiatives that have been particularly exciting to you in, in your work with Shirley. Sure. Uh, why don't I start with board diversity, since okay. that has been in the topic in the news quite a bit, and um, I can segue to another topic. Um, as well, but what we are finding is that, particularly in the U.S., the number of women on boards has been increasing. However, it's been increasing at a glacial pace. Mm -hmm. Right now, just 19% of the companies in the Standard & Poor 500 index um, are women. And yet women are two thirds of the consumers in our, in our country and they are increasingly becoming uh, asset owners and just really a, a voice that should be better represented in the boardroom. Just to help clarify real quick, so yeah. they're running the company as the CEO, just 19% of them, is that? 19% of board oh, members. Board members, I missed that thing. Board members. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, so in aggregate, yeah. it's 19%. Wow. Okay. Right. Um, and in other countries, you know, that it's closer to um, some countries 30. Uh, some countries are putting in some mandates to reach certain targets. We, we won't have a quota system in this country. I, I do not believe that will, will happen. But um, the concern is that, you know, as companies, uh, the competitive landscape has changed. Boards need to understand global um, markets and there's a tendency to have group think, certainly on a board if you do not have a diverse board vo voices. And there have been a number of studies conducted actually correlating improved financial performance to board diversity and board gender diversity in, in, um, especially. So we've been tying that business case of improved financial performance from diversity on boards to um, shareholder advocacy in, uh, initiatives with companies. Basically saying, listen, why do you not yet have any women on your boards, yet we are seeing data from Credit Suisse, data from McKinsey and Company, um, demonstrating that there are clear corporate governance benefits, clear financial benefits to a more, having a more diverse board. And it's led to some very constructive dialogues with corporate leadership. First, we've seen companies amend corporate governance guidelines, which is basically dictates how they will look for qualified candidates for their boards. They're including gender, race, and ethnicity in their board composition language. 
So that was really a first step for us to make sure companies understood that they, that diversity inclusive of gender, race, and ethnicity, ethnicity should be embedded in um, their guidelines when they're looking for talented and qualified candidates. And um, so we filed a number of shareholder proposals, um, 15 in the last three years, and have had uh, since then, uh, eight companies of those 15 have appointed women subsequent to successful dialogues with those, with those companies. And we're continuing to do that work. Uh, this year, we're continuing to look at workforce diversity too, uh, particularly in the technology sector, where the numbers of underrepresented minorities, Hispanics, African-Americans, um, has been very low, very low numbers in the tech industry. So we've had begun some very constructive dialogues with tech companies on how they can build the pipeline, how they can attract and retain diverse candidates, and how they can demonstrate, most importantly, to shareholders that they're putting in place programs to expand diversity in their workforce. But I'd love to talk about pollinators. Oh, good, yes. So tell As you mentioned, yeah. that's another issue. I mean, it kind of falls under the sustainable agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, Let me just preface, so before, we, before we started the interview, we were talking and Malika and I are both sustainable beekeepers. So we were very excited to see that um, Susan is not only on the board, but the chair of the board of the Pesticide Action Network. And yeah, and then it sounds like this is coming into your work at Trillium too. So tell us more. <laughs> sure. Well, we've been working on pesticide use reduction efforts, uh, but really seeing it as a systemic risk to companies uh, uh, who are, um, well, a systemic risk to our food system. I, I believe that's a better way for me to to preface this mm -hmm. is the decline in bee populations. You know, uh, bees uh, pollinate one in three bites that we put into our mouths. So they're, they are critical to so many crops, especially fruits and vegetables. And um, while there are many causes believed to be it has really been the pesticide, and it has the long name, it's a neonicotinoid, neonic for short. What do you say that again? Oh, uh, for short. It's increasingly neonicotinoid, yeah, neonic. Mm -hmm. uh, that's been um, creating a number of harms uh, to their immune system to their ability to forage and well, we are asking companies to, to report on efforts to re reduce use of that, that pesticide so as a shareholder advocate what I want to do is point out to companies the potential risk from mm -hmm. declining bee populations and the, the the escalating use of neonicotinoids and, and the impact it could have on our food system and demonstrate that it could work to their advantage to um, put in place policies and programs to mitigate the risk of that, that pesticide. Um, and we've talked to food companies. We had a number of very good dialogues with home improvement retailers mm -hmm. who have garden stores and they have, you know, they took quick action to realize their consumers do not want to buy plants that could potentially um, harm bees or, uh, you know, create unhealthy gardens because plants are sprayed with this, this um, neonicotinoid and the, and then bees take the pollen and back to their hives and, and uh, 
create that creates a number of harms. Mm -hmm. So we've had very successful dialogues in at least in the with home improvement retailers and understanding the risks. And Pesticide Action Network did play an important role as a subject expert. Mm -hmm. They have you know do science based research and. Uh, really were able to help us understand the issue and what corporations could do. Um, in addition to, you know, speaking out, uh, you know, at the state level too, where there can also be some uh, work done to protect bees. Are there other um, parts of your focus on sustainable agriculture outside? in addition to this piece of it, or is that really the, the focus there? That's pesticide use reduction has been one of the primary areas. Um, you know, another area we're looking at is somewhat related is, uh, is food waste oh. and looking at food companies and uh, asking them to put in comprehensive policies and practices to reduce food waste in their supply chain. And that actually is a sustainable agriculture issue, but it's also some, a climate change issue uh, and a social justice issue because all of this food is going to waste. So uh, that's one other issue that one of my colleagues has been taking up in the last two years and mm. getting some traction there. Yeah. Amazing. And so give us one more. I think this is really so interesting to hear about, but give us another area that you have focused on. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Uh, another social issue is looking at um, slave labor mm. in the seafood supply supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, I work on a lot of consumer issues and the, um, the Guardian newspaper uh, revealed some pretty egregious human rights abuses and labor and uh, labor, labor abuses in the seafood supply chain, particularly in the shrimp supply chain. And it impacted some real important brands uh, because they were able to trace that this seafood was sold here in the US. So that gave us an opportunity to talk to companies about mitigating reputational risk and improving their uh, labor and human rights standards that they put into their supplier contracts. And so this is getting down into the weeds, but really companies um, have to know where their, their ingredients, where their uh, where their suppliers get their raw materials because yeah. of social media, because of the ability to trace things uh, for consumers to know about these things. So it allowed us to help co two companies put in some pretty robust uh, social compliance programs where they're going to put in, uh, where they're going to audit more regularly and monitor and eventually report out, we hope, on the results of those audits um, and also join industry task force who are addressing the issue. I mean, this is happening in um, Thailand and an area where uh, U.S. brands have to better understand the traceability and the uh, labor issues um, because they get so much seafood from that part of the world. Yeah. I think, Malika, I think we were both in that... Um presentation last year at the SRI conference we met with together mm -hmm. where they were uh, talking about this issue and it, it was very eye-opening and I didn't know as much detail until that workshop about um, mm -hmm. one of the women who actually went and interviewed um, workers um, right who were basically living as slaves in right the, shrimp industry. It was pretty disturbing. So yeah, it's yeah. so important. I said two more sentences about our, uh, another issue, the emerging yeah. issue of chemical footprinting. Uh, you know, you've seen some of the major mass retailers come out 
and say that they're going to get rid of particular phthalates or parabens or formaldehyde, triclosan now, all these ingredients that we had in our toothpaste and our personal care lotions. Um, we're trying to get companies to submit to a survey where they would be benchmarked on their use of chemicals and their ability to phase out chemicals of high concern. Uh, and then, you know, kind of create this race to the top um, mentality where they understand where their chemicals come from and they can benchmark their own progress toward using safer chemicals. Certainly in Europe, you know, that's, there's been more action around seeking safer chemicals and we're hoping that um, we can, this type of tool can help companies here in the U.S. do the same thing. That's called the chemical footprint, somewhat akin to the carbon footprint that you've probably heard of. Yeah, that's amazing. You've been doing this particular work in shareholder advocacy for 10 years and you have 20 years in the investment industry. And I'm just really curious to hear from your perspective, um, what are the changes you've seen within the shareholder advocacy work that's being done and the receptivity from um, corporations in that 10 year span. Could you kind of highlight what you've seen as changes over time? Sure, I mean, I'll start off by saying just that the pace of information flow has accelerated tremendously. So we get information about companies, about um, corporate behavior, about NGOs and what they're finding out much more quickly than we did um, in the 80s and 90s, certainly. And uh, another big change, so information flow, flow would be number one. Number two would be the organizing capability of investor partner, investors like ourselves. Uh, Trillium leads on a number of issues, but we also collaborate with like-minded socially responsible investors or uh, other foundations or NGOs uh, who are also concerned about particular issues. And that ability to create coalitions has um, also grown by leaps and bounds. And that's made our work more effective because we just have more people to draw on to uh, inquire or uh, press companies on a particular issue and engage. And I would also say the third thing is that companies, to their credit, and I mean, I think it's been a learning process on both sides, have now have um, more expertise. Uh, they've developed that expertise. I mean, there's still a ways to go, but they have sustainability officers. They have uh, company representatives who are well-versed on these issues, who can speak to them. They're understanding they need to disclose more because not only investors like ourselves want this information, but um, rating agencies are starting to look at this information, Bloomberg. Uh, so companies are getting more adept at providing disclosures that are, are meaningful. I mean, we have a ways to go, but where we've come from um, is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. So uh, Susan, how do you see women investors are engaging uh, with Trillium to create positive change? Well, I'd like to start off by first saying that women have been, been investing with, um, engaging with Trillium for positive change since 1982 when Joan Bavaria conceived this idea of, of Trillium, which back then was called Franklin Research and Development. And I remember her telling me the story that it was a woman client who came to her with the idea of calling up a company and finding out, you know, trying to engage a company on a particular uh, social issue. And Joan really realized that um, 
understanding environmental and social performance of a company was important to investors and voting proxies uh, and understanding the issues on the ballot was important to her clients. And gradually she began to integrate that and have a, some terrific researchers who would write about companies' um, environmental and social profiles. We produced a, a newsletter uh, still called Investing for a Better World, but it had very detailed uh, analyses of companies and their environmental and social records. And, and granted, back then it was hard to get good information, um, but she felt that was very important. She felt that uh, talking to companies and understanding their policies and practices and what goals they were reaching toward on reducing uh, you know, carbon emissions on, um, uh, you know, treating their workers uh, in an equitable fashion. Those were all really important to her and a growing number of clients. I'd also say that we have, women can make an impact, are making an impact by filing shareholder proposals. So when I uh, go to a company, we don't, as a firm, hold shares. So clients um, of Trillium sponsor the shareholder proposals. And I've worked with a number of women who've, who've sponsored the board diversity proposals. Mm. Um, and they're very happy too, because they know their, their assets are making an impact. Uh, and my the third thing I would add is that we have a number of women clients who are involved in work to promote the rights to, to protect and promote, promote the rights of women and girls around the world. And so in, in running these organizations, they want their endowments and operating reserves to be invested in, in um, financial assets that align with their mission. So by investing in Trillium's uh, products and strategies, they're able to do that. So they do their day-to-day -day work and they know that their um, operating reserves or endowment funds are also doing a similar work. Yeah, and are you seeing foundations um, more and more open to that type of alignment? Yes, I would say that uh, certainly that has grown and, you know, as you've seen, there are more and more academic studies demonstrating uh, that one need not give up financial performance or sacrifice financial performance uh, when considering social and environmental factors. Mm -hmm. You know, Trillium's record certainly demonstrates that in many of our our um, partners in the industry also have similar records that on a risk adjusted basis, financial returns are not sacrificed. Mm -hmm. um, Susan, we're so curious to hear about uh, kind of your personal story about what really what drew you to this work. How did you get here? Sure. Well, I have to give credit to my mother she sent me a newspaper clipping, right? Mothers um, are, are there for us when we need them. And it, it was back when I was between jobs, jobs, and she sent me a newspaper clipping that described the work of South Shore Bank. Mm -hmm. was the bank was the first uh, community development bank in the US. And they um, actually, worked on the south side of Chicago, uh, creating low-income housing back in the 70s. So this clipping she described, she sent me described the work of the South Shore Bank. I had had some experience with an investment firm here in Boston before I worked at Trillium. And I had taken a break thinking I wanted to do something different. Uh, that article plus um, the help of my advisor at graduate school uh, put me in a position where I was spoke to another woman here in Boston who had done some socially responsible investing work. She introduced me to Joan Bavaria and uh, I then got a job working for, for Joan. Uh, 
mm -hmm. um, in the early days of Trillium. And it was a great way for me to, to combine uh, my humanistic interests that I've had uh, throughout my life with some financial experience early in my career and um, really have enjoyed uh, working uh, for this company for this long, 24 years almost. We'd love to hear if there's been something that you feel like is um, particular to your unique contribution in the field. So, you know, to you, and then also to Trilli you know, Trillium's unique contribution in the field. Sure. Um, yeah, I thought about that question. We know it can uh, be a tough one, especially personally, but um, we think there's a lot of amazing stories out there that women have. So. So, I mean, I think what's unique, what Trillium is contributing that is unique is that socially responsible investing is all that we do and all that we've ever done. So we're not controlled by a larger entity or um, we have some autonomy. I feel like I can be nimble in what I want to pursue uh, particularly with shareholder advocacy initiatives. So having that history of independence, um, I think is something that's unique. And related to that, I would say is our, has been our ability to, to identify key emerging issues. Trillium was the first firm to file a shareholder proposal asking companies to include sexual orientation in their non-discrimination policies, really to ask company to, to explicit, be explicit in their protections for uh, LGBT uh, um, uh, employees in their workforce. So it really was an area where we were out in front also on a number of um, uh, you know, the pollinator issue was one that we uh, took a lead on. So I'm really proud of the fact that we're able to um, identify and begin to create change on a number of emerging issues. I think that's something that's unique. And, and just that our investment process um, has the critical integration at the fundamental analyst level. Um, we have dedicated teams who look at both the financial and the environmental, social, and governance characteristics of a company. So it's not siloed in a particular ESG department. It really permeates our entire firm, from our investment management team um, that I constantly communicate with um, through, uh, you know, the investment managers who talk to clients. So it's, it's really a, a full circle of communication. Just to jump in real quick, I think that is really apparent to us from the advisor side and the investor side, that when mm -hmm. part of our role is to really sift through um, all, especially these days, more and more people are jumping on board to this thing called socially responsive investing or green investing or ESG. Right. And so we, you know, we're seeing the lip service, you know, greenwashing kind of approaches um, and really sorting through what really rises to the top. And for us, Trillium is such a strong example of, how it's clear. I mean, it's just clear what you said, that it's very much a part of the foundational approach. You know, it's not just an yeah. add on to, you know, do some marketing. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah. Thank you. What do you feel like your unique contribution has been in the work? Oh, well, um, I think something we didn't talk about was the fact I've, I've had two careers at Trillium. In my first career, for the first 14 years that I was here, I was uh, 
a portfolio manager and equity analyst. So I had more interaction with clients and uh, talked to companies um, more about their financial uh, uh, performance. So I, and then I left for the company left the company for six years to work closer to my community and be closer with my, to my children or spend more time with my children. So I um, came back to the shareholder advocacy team subsequent to that six year break. So I think what I bring to Trillium is this unique, this long perspective of having been on the, um, in the early days of working closely with clients in their portfolios. And then now um, on the advocacy side, speaking more directly to the companies um, whose stock we hold. So I'm getting, you know, I can kind of bring both sides to bear, um, not only to the organizational structure of our company, but also to the work of shareholder advocacy, having understood where, where the pulse of clients and, um, and some of the financial performance uh, experience has really helped me in the advocacy side also. Uh, but I, you know, I get excited about this work because I, I, I do have two grown, two millennials now. And um, yeah, we, I think, anyone who's a parent wants to make some contribution in some small way to uh, make sure the planet is healthy and the economy is, is a healthy um, economy as we move in through the 21st century. So uh, I think I, I feel that I'm making some contribution to the future generations. What would you like to see in this space that you're not seeing yet um, and or that you'd like to see exponentially more of? Sure. Well, I, I think as Carrie alluded to, there's, um, it's just been terrific to see the number of asset owners beginning to integrate environmental and social and governance issues into their investment analysis, uh, the decision-making process, however, yeah, we need more shareholder advocates, really. We need that engagement piece uh, because as a shareholder, that being a shareholder, um, with that status comes responsibility, I believe, to exercise your shareholder rights and uh, demand, you know, some answers about corporate behavior and uh, understanding of how you know, corporations have a license to operate in, in communities and making sure that they are um, being fair and just and uh, accountable for their actions. So I really think that merely taking data from a company's website, um, informing decisions is one step and one uh, important step in analyzing companies because uh, that creates greater awareness on the part of the in entire investment community. But uh, being a serious owner, I, a more serious owner really involves the engagement piece. So one of the critics, I guess the kind of uh, the main criticism I've heard or read about shareholder advocacy is one of the pillars of socially responsive investing is that it's really not effective. So what would, and I know you've, you've really answered that to some degree already, but what do you say to someone who has that criticism? Well, I would say that um, you have to look across all issue areas. Uh, I would have to say that um, that there has been change, uh, and sometimes it doesn't happen in one year or two years, but it happens over three or four years. And um, I think the issues there have been more 
changes on, for example, workplace protections, the uh, LGBTQ is issues that I talked about is earlier. I think what you might be alluding to is engagement perhaps. Um, we haven't seen as much movement on climate change. Mm -hmm. And even though we have had tremendous engagement with companies on climate change, we're still heating up the planet. And why is that? So, you know, rightfully so, that's, that's an area where the impact that, that shareholder engagement has made, um, you know, that story's starting to be told, but it's, it still bumps up against the fact that we're still warming the planet and, and we're not going to change the oil industry by engaging them necessarily, and that's not going to reverse the trend. Um, so, yes, that's, that's been a, a very um, much debated topic on the issue of impact and outcome. But I, I have to say, um, I've just seen it in the last two years on board diversity. Shareholders are making an impact, no doubt about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's one area I can, I can, can say. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, well, I think companies realize that it's, and I've had, I've had um, companies leadership tell me that we've we've known this had to be a priority. Um, we just haven't made it a priority until shareholders called us up and to start talking about it. So that. And we, we don't always hear back from companies that way. That's part of the problem of measuring impact. We as an industry are trying to get better at measuring impact. Um, and what I have found, though, is sometimes there are internal champions at a company, um, but having that having a shareholder be another lever for their cause or just being another voice. Um, I think there's some truth to the fact that that can um, move an issue, affect some change. Yeah. So when you say a shareholder, who are you really talking about? Or like, what, what does that really look like? Right, so we, Trillium, I represent shareholders mm -hmm. for Trillium. Right, so we go to the company saying that our shareholders of XYZ company notice that you do not have any board diversity. We're concerned about that issue because we're shareholders. We want to, we're long term shareholders. We want this company to. Uh, grow and take advantage of all its potential market opportunities and without diverse representation on its board, how can you know your marketplace? How can you understand your consumer um, in this growing competitive global environment that you operate in? So it's the shareholder is our client, right? Mm -hmm. And we're the we're, we're their authorized agent to go to the company and engage. So let's bring it back around. You had mentioned climate change. So where are you seeing, and, and that that's really an area where it's been more difficult than some other issues to really make impact with shareholder advocacy. So where are you seeing kind of the, the, opportunity, the opportunities or where do you think it makes sense to focus for you all? So where we think companies make an impact. There's been two areas we've been focusing on. That is on renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So companies are doing a lot of work to change their light bulbs, uh, just be more eco efficient, uh, but part of and setting targets to be more efficient. But renewable energy, investing in wind solar, has to be part of that portfolio mix of getting energy. So we've been asking companies to set target to buy renewable energies. And, and that's been very successful. Um, another area has been asking is working on a public policy issue. Uh, and 
we organized an investor statement. So sometimes we file shareholder proposals, but I haven't talked about this other avenue where investors can get together and create a statement saying, we believe the EPA's rule to regulate methane emissions is a very good rule. Methane emissions are a very potent greenhouse gas and there's so much leakage coming from pipes in this country. We need to get a better handle on that. So uh, in addition to shareholder advocacy work, we can work in the regulatory arena and provide um, you know, our representatives in Washington or leaders of state departments information. Like you probably don't hear from investors. Um, let us tell you how investors think about methane emissions and how it can improve the long-term prospects of uh, corporate corporations if we had a better understanding of, of um, how much methane is leaking and how that could impact climate change. So we, uh, like $3.6 trillion in assets under management came together. Um, that was all investor dollars basically saying that we need to address, the oil and gas sector needs to address methane emissions. And this is one primarily, primarily through natural gas pipelines, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so this rule is going to um, uh, start the path of better measuring and better containing those gases. Um, and it and it's moneyed out the door too for companies, right? <laughs> if they have leaky pipes. Um, that was a very successful initiative uh, in part because we did get feedback from um, the rule makers saying it was really important for us to hear the investor voice. You know, Ooh. that helped us, you know, create a stronger, strong rule. Um, and, and, and so that was an instance where we could bring to bear um, some important information about climate change, some important information about corporate practices and business and reputational risks, and uh, work together to hopefully create some change. And when you say rule maker, do you mean within the company or regulatory body? Regulatory, regulatory okay. body, right. So, um, this was going to the EPA essentially was making the final rule. Was there anything else you'd like to highlight or share about your work or the work of Trillium and shareholder advocacy? I mean, I just going back to women, I would say that um, women have a, have a powerful voice, an important voice. I mean, clearly I talked about their voice. It's important in the boardroom. It's important in, in the workplace. Uh, but also as an investor. I mean, I think it's, it's important for women investors to understand that socially responsible and sustainable investing does not mean sacrificed returns, number one. And unfortunately, I think that myth is still out there because women who feel that they're not financial savvy will um, perhaps back off if they hear that statement. Uh, so that, I think we still have to kind of get that message out there. Um, and I'll, so I would say that um, it's exciting to see more women investing more women understanding they can make an impact with the public equity markets uh, using financial assets using share share ownership to affect social change great and men are doing it too, men are doing it too of but course. I think it's, yeah, uh, yeah I, I just think it's particularly empowering for <laughs> women to see women in places of um, decision making and leadership and realizing that uh, 
they can speak up and have a voice and ask for higher wages and, you know, leadership positions and vote their proxies and ask questions to their financial advisors. So um, it's an exciting time. I'd just like to add, I think it's also really an empowering element to know that, you know, um, that the, the kind of positive effect that that can have, like for a company, I think you've I would imagine that part of the reason it's been so well received is that there's this financial bottom line that you can show them that says, well, when you include more women, when you have a more diverse board, you have a, a financially stronger company. And that seems like a, a, a good motivator and a good um, place for women to understand that this, this is what they bring to the table. It's, it's a benefit for everyone. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Over half of the workforce here at Trillium are, are women. <laughs> Oh, wow. Right now. Yeah. Great. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we're growing and uh, women are well represented and it's a good mix. Almost 50-50, but we're t the women tilt a little bit. I think it's like 54%, mm -hmm. 46%. <laughs> and Joan, um, you know, she had a very nurturing uh, Demeanor, um, you know, very tough, but also very nurturing. I mean, this is, she liked to create things. She was an artist from the start, the start. So she wanted to create a firm that walked the talk, that uh, made, you know, invested for a better world. Yeah. Super. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for your time. And it's so great to hear about this legacy, essentially, of Trillium and how long you've been a part of that and uh, the work that you all continue to do and be a leader, you know, in and um, so great. So thanks so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Enjoyed speaking with you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.